Hello everybody, it's Debbie Evans here and as you can see this isn't Rolo, this is the fake Rolo perched up on my shoulder. Um, today's reading is from the fourth book in the Secret Adventures of Rolo series, Jewel Dog and the Dragons, and this is the chapter about Rolo revisiting the Bronze Age. You may recall that he's actually visited the Bronze Age in book two, The Chilvester Passage, but this is about a new Bronze Age discovery. I was dozing under the dining table with my left ear raised. I could hear the floppy-haired boy shuffling about with his homework diary and sorting his pencil case, and it occurred to me that he wasn't doing very much in the way of writing. I wondered if the smiley lady was as easily fooled. Mum, he addressed the smiley lady. Yes, love, she replied absentmindedly, whilst concentrating hard on a crossword puzzle clue. Have you heard about the recent excavation of an important Bronze Age settlement in East Anglia? The smiley lady put down the pen and took off her glasses. No, tell me about it, she said encouragingly. Well, just before the turn of the century in 1999, long before I was born, an East Anglian archaeologist discovered a series of wooden posts sticking out of a quarry. Further investigation revealed the most important Bronze Age settlement ever discovered in Britain, and in 2005, Must Farm was partially excavated. The intention, I think, was to study and log the finds and then allow nature to continue to preserve the historic site in the Fenland mud. But it was soon realised that exposure to the air sped up the decay of these 3,000 year old relics. And so the decision was taken to fully excavate the site between 2015 and 2016. It's interesting because the discovery has changed the way we think about people in the Bronze Age and how they lived. Wow, that's amazing, the smiley lady enthused, but why did the artifacts start to disintegrate? Because they've been preserved in the mud for centuries, can you believe things like woven cloth fibre, food in bowls, thatched roof and floor coverings remained intact? The real mystery though, and what my homework question is about, is what happened at Must Farm because it seems to have been destroyed by fire and the inhabitants fled rather rapidly and never returned to rebuild their homes. How exciting, said the smiley lady, and they started to discuss possible reasons. My ear went down and I really did go to sleep then, dreaming of Flint, the dog I had met in Amesbury during my last Bronze Age adventure. Later that night, when the house was quiet and I'd been tucked up in my basket and told to be a good boy with no woof-woofs in the night, I crept out, tiptoed across the kitchen floor and opened the cupboard under the sink. I manoeuvred the obstacles in my way and out through the trapdoor I escaped to the great outdoors. Down the garden steps I bounded two at a time, no time to greet next door's rabbits, under the gate and into the forest, along the path, under the bushes, and at last to the foot of the great oak tree to find Athelstan, the tree dragon. Athelstan took a while to reveal himself to me and I thought at first he was playing a joke, but he said he'd been in a deep sleep. Well, what brings you here, little pup? He boomed affectionately. Can't you sleep? The floppy-haired boy has an interesting history question for his homework, and I wondered if you might know the answer. I'm all ears, little pup, the dragon smiled, stroking his jaw with his left claw, which, in my opinion, only added to his air of wisdom. I explained to the tree dragon about the Bronze Age village at Must, and he listened and nodded sagely. Then I think you must go there and see for yourself. Athelstan guffawed at his little joke. Did you bring the orb? I retrieved the pink ball from its hidey hole at the base of the tree, as this was the key to my entering the time tunnel. Without the pink ball, the entrance would not open. As if by magic, Yulia and Dar, the woodland folk, appeared holding their tiny lanterns aloft, ready to light my way. Where are we off to, Paddy Paws? smiled Yulia as I bent down so she could stand on a tree root and scratch behind my ears the way I liked it best. 
Athelstan explained the location and exact moment in time needed, and Yulia nodded, ushering me toward the time tunnel. Ooh, that's a long way away and a long way back in time, grumbled elderly Dar, rubbing his back as he plodded slowly towards the entrance. I can take paddy paws on my own, Dar. You don't have to come, volunteered Yulia, stepping into the hole, but Dar was having none of it. Keep your eyes open and beware of dragons, whispered Athelstan, as he faded to become part of the tree bark once more. I'm not sure what he meant by that remark, but I kept it in mind. The journey through the narrow passages of the underground time tunnel seemed to take forever. Dahl was right, it was a long way to go to East Anglia and a long way back in history. We discussed happenings in the forest to pass the time, the coming of spring and the appearance of wild garlic poking its green shoots up through the leaf mould covering the forest floor. I'd learnt from the woodland folk that it was called the understory as opposed to the canopy, which was the treetops. When we emerged into the sunlight, the first thing I noticed was that the air seemed cooler and there was water all around us but I couldn't smell the sea. We appeared to be inland. We will wait in the time tunnel entrance, Paddy Paws. Off you go and do what you have to do, said Yulia as she waved me off. Well, the first thing I had to do was have a wee, but enough about that. I don't want to bore you with too much detail. I could see several large round huts ahead of me and what struck me as unusual was that they were, they were raised up on wooden stilts and built on top of the water. I think I counted seven dwellings in total. It puzzled me at first as to why villagers would build their huts over the water. And then I saw a number of long wooden boats loaded up with goods plying backwards and forwards along the waterways. I wondered if this place was linked to the rest of Britain and perhaps further afield to mainland Europe by water. Yulia had told me on our journey that this Bronze Age settlement in East Anglia was very like those found in Germany, Holland and Switzerland, dating from the same era, 1000 BC. It seemed likely that these foreign nations traded together long before Europe was established. Indeed, exotic beads recently found at Must Farm confirmed the belief that the dwellers enjoyed wealth and trade with other countries. I gleaned this bit of information from the floppy head boy's homework handout, which he'd left lying on the table. Unobserved, I climbed up on one of the roundhouses and immediately noticed a large wooden wheel on a spindle lying flat just off the floor. I'd never seen the likes of this before and couldn't wait to report back to Athelstan. I thought wheels had come into use much later in history. I wondered what its purpose was in this hut and thought it was perhaps for, used for grinding cereal crops, but I heard footsteps approaching, so I couldn't hang around to find out. Outside the hut, I had a good look at the materials that had been used to construct the different dwellings. This round building was a detached wooden structure with what looked like hazel branches interlocking around circular posts to make walls and water reeds woven together to make a kind of thatched roof. Thanks to my nature lessons from the woodland folk, I was able to identify these plants. Inside, there was a rush mat floor covering, like an ancient carpet. All highly flam flammable, the health and safety aware side of me thought. I could tell by the items of clothing lying around that the dwellers appeared to be well dressed. Certainly their clothes were finer than those worn by the Amesbury folk I'd previously met. I'm no expert, but I would guess that they were made from woven plant fibres, which gave them a depth of texture and an appearance of quality. I peered into another hut and saw someone working hard with a flax stem beater, and two women were winding bobbins with newly spun thread. This was a great hive of industry, so much for the myth that Bronze Age Britain was backward. This settlement seemed to me to be very progressive indeed. Outside a third hut, I observed a group of men honing their shiny bronze swords still steaming from the blacksmith's fire where they had been forged by pouring molten metal into a mould. I remember the floppy-haired boy marvelling that it took one kilo of bronze to make one sword, 
I watched the muscular blacksmith at work with admiration. This was a very wealthy group of people and they were well armed. A thought occurred to me, were they perhaps expecting an invasion? Those heavy swords were surely made for killing, not hunting. Did these people feel threatened and were they sensing danger? From, from whom might they be expecting an attack? The waterways were no doubt useful for trade, but might make them vulnerable to invasion by foreigners. Were these dwellers themselves traders or invaders? The water would have linked them to other settlements along waterways such as the Trent or the Thames or further abroad across the sea. Were other people jealous of their apparent wealth? There were so many questions racing around in my furry head. I didn't have long to wait to find out what happened here. Athelstan was always very accurate with pinpointing the right time in history to send me to. I settled myself behind one of the huts and pondered what might have happened to cause this place to become deserted in a hurry and why it had collapsed into the mud of the river it straddled. I must have dozed off, enjoying a little power nap, because the next thing I heard was the rhythmic beating of wings. It sounded very much like an approaching dragon and I was not disappointed. In fact, there were two dragons and I'm just going to pause to show you Chantal's drawing here of incoming dragons. In fact, there were two dragons, different looking, one red and one white, roaring and breathing fire and swooping at each other as if they were in some kind of aerial combat. This was terrifying. It was all very well Athelstan telling me to look out for dragons, but how was I expected to stay safe? They didn't seem at all friendly. Time and time again, the dragons clashed and scorched each other's scaly armour-plated bodies and roared at each other as neither gave way in, in their relentless attack. I wondered what they were fighting over. The terrified villagers came flocking out from the roundhouses, glanced up at the sky and fled the scene, grabbing weapons as they ran. They left everything else behind them in their hurry to escape the dragon fight. I had the impression this wasn't the first time they'd seen warring dragons overhead. Pots were overturned, livestock abandoned and jewellery scattered in the frantic panic of escape. Men, women and children jumped into their flotilla of longboats and beat their oars as if their lives depended on it. This was a mass evacuation. I watched open mouthed from my vantage point behind a tree, marvelling at these two mighty creatures fighting in the sky. I was distracted from this awesome spectacle when I started to feel an intense heat very close by and realised in horror that in their battle, the careless dragons had set fire to the thatched roofs of must settlement. The roundhouses caught fire easily from the fiery dragon's breath and were soon burning fiercely and as they burned the structures were collapsing on their stilts and falling into the water below. It only took a matter of minutes, perhaps no more than ten in all, for the Bronze Age settlement to be reduced to a pile of smouldering timber lying sizzling in the water. There were no humans left at the scene, only two very angry dragons and this small four-legged eyewitness. Finally, the fire breathers seemed to call some sort of truce by making a signal pointing their wings. First the white dragon and then the red came swiftly down to land just in front of the tree I was hiding behind. The dragons had no knowledge of the extent of the chaos and, de and devastation they had caused by their quarrel. Come on, Rolo, YOLO, you only live once. That's what the floppy haired boy often said to me, and I said it out loud to bolster my courage as I stepped out to confront them both. Look what you two have done. You've completely destroyed a whole village. What on earth are you fighting about? Both dragons span round and looked at me angrily, and the white one spoke first. It's a long running battle between we two. We fight the length and breadth of Britain. But why would you do that? I asked. For territory, they said in unison. He started it, snarled the red dragon. No, you did, countered the white. The pair sounded like arguing children to me. I wanted to add, and I'm going to finish it, like I'd heard the smiley lady say to resolve an argument. 
I'm the rightful dragon of Britain. The English call me Riod, but I'm Welsh by birth, said the red dragon. And I am Alba, piped up the white dragon, puffing out his chest. I'm the rightful dragon of Britain, being English by birth. Well, well, I thought to myself. So there were more dragons flying around than the old red one and the young white dragonling that I knew. I think you two had better be more careful where you carry out your skirmishes. I drew myself up to full height and bravely squared up to the dragons. Otherwise, you're going to wipe out the whole of Britain and then neither of you will be the rightful dragon of anywhere. The dragons looked at me suspiciously. Then Riod said, Take care, Dogka, because although you are small, you would make a tasty snack and we are hungry. The dragons took to the air, dive bomb towards me, skimming over the top of my head and then shot off in a westerly direction. See you over the marches, shouted Riod the Red. And I'd like to see you try and defend them next time, shouted Alba the White, tilting his wings in a defiant gesture. I thought I'd handled that rather well. Dragons won, humans nil, I muttered, trying to quell my terrier shake as I headed back to the time tunnel entrance, casting a final look over my shoulder at the huts that were sinking fast into the river. I was pleased to see the twinkling welcome of Yulia's lantern in the entrance to the time tunnel. Shouldn't we do something about putting the fire out? I asked the woodland folk, voicing my concern about the burning village. Don't worry, the river is taking care of it, said Dar. And sure enough, the village was soon engulfed by water, dousing the flames and leaving little trace, just the smell of burnt timber in the air and a wisp of smoke rising from the water. This village would lay undiscovered by man for the next 3,000 years. Haven't you finished your homework yet? I heard the smiley lady ask the floppy haired boy at the weekend. Well, judging by all the bronze swords that were found at the place, I reckon the village was attacked and the inhabitants probably fled by boat, the floppy haired boy replied and then added, but that doesn't explain the scorch marks on the remains of the timber found in the river mud, nor does it account for why the villagers never returned to rebuild, nor why the invaders didn't settle in the place that they'd conquered. I could tell the floppy head boy was not very happy with the wishy-washy conclusion of his homework. I wished I could share with him my first-hand knowledge. Wouldn't he love to know that Must Farm was accidentally destroyed by Riod and Alba fighting over the right to be recognised as the Supreme Dragon of Britain? So there we shall leave it for today. That was a chapter from The Secret Adventures of Rolo, book four, Jewel Dog and the Dragons. And I'll be back live on Rolo's Facebook page which is facebook.com slash Rolo Dog Blog on Monday afternoon at 3.15. And you can find us um, every weekday afternoon reading to you live from his series of books. Thank you for listening. Goodbye.